Hey friends, my name's Georgie and this is the Just Breathe podcast where I'll be talking all things breathing to help empower you guys to use the power of your breath to harness your bodies and minds. In today's episode, I'll be speaking to Simon Borg Olivia. Simon is a yoga teacher and co-director of Yoga Synergy, one of Australia's oldest and most respected yoga schools. Simon is also a research scientist as well as a university lecturer and has been seen at many conferences and workshops in the wellness industry across the world since the 1990s. Simon's ability to simplify the key aspects of yoga, breathwork, the body and the mind are just second to none and our conversation was so incredibly powerful. We got into topics such as the real meaning of yoga, as well as the key foundational aspects of meditation. I hope you really enjoy this conversation as much as I did. If you haven't already, don't forget to like, share and subscribe to the Just Breathe podcast. Let's keep empowering people with the power of the breath. Let's keep creating that strong breathing community. All right, let's delve right into this powerful conversation. This is episode 15 of Just Breathe with Simon Borg Olivia. Hey Simon, how are you doing? Such a pleasure to have you on. How's it going? Georgie, it's such a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure to have you on the Just Breathe podcast. I'd love to jump straight in. I absolutely adored your masterclass um, about joint synergy, which I'm sure we will get on to but I'd love to actually go right back to the beginning um I first came across you at the embodiment conference um where I noticed there was a little bit on there about your upbringing and that your dad was heavily involved in free diving and that you you grew up actually holding your breath underwater from such an early age and in in terms of the the breath and you know that you're you're such a a brilliant teacher of the breath now I'd, I'd love to hear on that influence from such a young age of growing up with that my dad uh, was an amazing man mm-hmm. he um he actually won a medal from queen elizabeth wow. as a, a bravery medal because in i think it was 1953 i mean he was maybe 15 16 years old same age as my daughter wow. and he was um coming home from his job and uh, there was a bus that had, a school bus had gone over the edge of a cliff in Malta. I was born in Malta and he, um, the bus had gone off the edge of the cliff and all the kids had escaped from the bus and swam to the shore, but the bus driver was stuck under the water and it was quite deep and it was freezing cold winter. And my dad just didn't think and just, dived in the water and swam to the driver and pulled him out. And apparently he was underwater unconscious for 20 minutes. Oh but, my goodness. You know, surprisingly, no brain damage, perfectly fine. It makes you wonder. Yeah, and, it know, really does. Got an award from the, the queen, a medal of honor from the queen. You know, it was, he was quite an amazing man. Yeah, that's incredible. So you, you know, you were learning to control your breath from mm. day one right? Yes, yes. He was very clear. I mean, I was six years old when he first started doing it to me and I'd gone for my my 50 meter swimming certificate. Right. He was a very busy man. He was in the army, mm. uh, the English army. And uh, he realized that I was failing my 50 meter certificate because I would just sink. My bones were quite heavy and I would just go straight under. Ah. So he said, son, if you're going to sink, you're going to have to learn to stay under. <laughs> and so he, you know, told me things you do not take more than two breaths in before you go under, you know, never hyperventilate. And, uh, you know, this is the sort of thing you have to do to relax while you're under the water. And he taught me really good basic techniques, which, you know, at six years old, they stuck with me. And yeah. it really made an impact on the practice I continued because it was something then I did 
you know, for the rest of my life. And of when we came to Australia, the first thing that my father did in the first year of our new house there was build a really nice swimming pool. Right. And you know, so it's what we did. You know, me and my sister were in the pool every day. And it's funny, we um we came, we were living in Sydney for a long time with my family when you know right. as an adult, I grew up and I've got two kids, so we're now 16 and 13. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I did when I moved them to our property, which is about it's in yeah, the Byron Bay Shire, it is yeah. many people have heard of it. And so it's about a thousand kilometers north of Sydney. And the first mm -hmm. thing I did was put myself in massive debt and uh, build a swimming pool for my <laughs> kids because I thought it was such an important gift that my parents gave us yeah. and uh, and my kids also they they can swim really well my daughter can do four or five laps of the pool underwater and you know me, me and my son we do fight we do it's called face fight race and we just go underwater and just fight and hit Whoa. each other you know <laughs> amazing amazing <laughs> and you ended up free diving a lot yourself then as an adult did you carry it on look um when i was 18 years old, mm. I was scuba diving and free diving right. in the um, Barrier Reef of Australia. Wow. And while free diving one time, I had an incident where my buddy was just malingering under the water a little bit too long. And I kept yeah. saying, we've got to go up, we've got to go up. And he's going, yeah, it's okay, it's okay. But I, I stuck with him because he's my buddy. And you know, right. so it's very important that you stay with your buddy. And um and then when I came up, I got a massive ear infection and the eardrum burst because of oh, the excess pressure. Right. And yeah. after that, I mean, my ears are OK, but I don't go deep. Mm. So my free diving is quite shallow free diving, which is still right. free diving as far yeah, as I'm of concerned. Course, of course. But I don't do the really deep stuff, you know. Right, right, right. So where did the yoga come into that and those other spiritual practices that are such a big part of, of your teaching now and my in the lead um, up. Yes. My uh, my trip to Australia, which happened when I was eight years old, mm. uh, went via South Africa and we picked up ah. a couple of um, amazing passengers. And one of them was a man called Basil Brown, right. who was a Rhodesian, which is now Zimbabwe athlete. Right. And he was a remarkable man. And he'd learned Indian yoga from the people in Rhodesia, you know, pre right. presumably Indian expats in Rhodesia. Yeah. And uh, so he taught me Uddiyana Bandha, Nauli and Lauliki, mm -hmm. which are these exercises where you can roll your internal organs and, you know, wow. uh, control rectus abdominis, uh, yeah. transverse abdominis, and all these internal abdominal control muscles, which really make an important part of my practice. But the yeah. thing about them is you have to do them while holding the breath out. So the fact right. that my father had spent already a couple of years training me meant that I could do these very difficult exercises that even his children weren't that able to do. Mm. And, um, you know, bless his whole family. You know, it's when I was very, very upset the last couple of days, uh, my mother passed away a couple of days ago and yeah. uh, very sadly, but, uh, but Andrew, the Andrew, who's the son of, mm. of, Basil, who was my, my teacher, mm. he rang me up and he's just a wise, beautiful yogi man himself. And he talked to me in the most beautiful way. Yeah. I mean, his father also passed away many years ago. Right. But um, that's where I learned Uddiyana Bandha, Nauli Lauliki, which I didn't find out for another 10, 10, 10 years. I found out through my Tibetan Lama. I got it, I met through some odd Amazing. circumstances a Tibetan Lama and he took me under his wing for about a year or so and you know he knew that I could do these breath control things and he taught me what he later revealed was uh, Tibetan yoga tantric yeah. yoga ah because it's so, quite secretive Tibetan yoga right yes 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 he yeah. was very secretive yeah. And so I, I got a, a hint of an interest in it then. I thought, oh, yoga, this is interesting. And then when he disappeared, I went to a yoga class. Right. And I think it was some sort of such an under, Shivananda type yoga. But yeah. it was, in, in retrospect, it was very traditional yoga, but there was no depth in the instructions. So we were doing something like a twist, and I'm like 17 or 18 years old, and we're twisting like this. Right. And I'm thinking, uh, so what what does this do i don't see the point you know right it was right, like right. 
this is nothing to do with what my teacher had taught me. Yeah. So it seemed very redundant, very basic, very stupid. And I just lost it for a few years, ignored it. I carried on my breath work mm. and my Uddiyana Bandha. And then it was um, when I finished my first university degree, I was about uh, 20 years old and I got a girlfriend who told me she was going to study law. So I thought, oh, if she's staying at university. Maybe I should stay too. Right. So I embarked on a postgraduate research in molecular biology and genetics and stuff like this. But in doing that, I realized maybe I should do some exercise. So right. I went to um, fitness classes, aerobics classes, you know, Jane Fonda style, jump up mm -hmm. and down and a bit of weight training. And in my exuberance doing YMCA and right, stuff right. like this, jumping yeah. around like a lunatic, I, I managed to damage my knees and I got shin splints and all sorts of crazy injuries from running around yeah. hard concrete floors. In those days, aerobics was very new. Right. right. And so uh, my, um, uh, my teacher relegated me to standing in the corner and instead of running, I would have to just jog back and forth looking it, it, on the spot. And yeah. It was very boring. Right, and right, right. She said, look, you know, you, you look very uncomfortable. How about trying this exercise? And she gave me what effectively was a yoga exercise. It was uh, called Supta Virasana, where you lie back between your legs. A very yeah. uncomfortable exercise for most people, but I could right. do it. And it fixed my shin splints. And I was... Totally, and I said, look, this is amazing. You know, the, do you have any more exercises like this? And she said, you should come to my stretch class. And I thought, right. okay, I'll come to a stretch class. And it was in a gym. And a, a few weeks into the class, she couldn't come for some reason. So they had a, a last minute thought, let's call a yoga teacher. So they called a professional Iyengar yoga teacher. Amazing. And this woman came in and taught me again this twist that I'd been doing a couple of years right, before. Right, I go, not this again. Yeah. But then she said to me, press down your foot this way, move your arm this way, tighten your arm. I thought, oh, that changes everything. I went, right. this instructions. And it really awakened me. And so that embarked me then upon a, a, an intense teacher training course with Japanese yoga that was infused with Iyengar oh. yoga, Oki oh, yoga. Okay. And that became a, a, an intensive course, which I did like five or six intensive trainings in a row, three hours a day, five mornings a week wow. for about two years. And then um, wow. my, my teacher, you know, insisted that I start teaching. I didn't want to teach. She just <laughs> made me teach. And uh, I met Shandor Remete, who was a, a, an amazing person. Now he teaches shadow yoga. Right. And uh, in his teaching, he was, he was a, a military man as well. And so because of his military background, I resonated with him straight away because it was like my father. Right. And, yeah. and Shandor then sent me to meet Iyengar. So then after teaching for a few years in 1985, I went to visit BKS Iyengar. Mm -hmm. And I went maybe... Well, maybe seven or eight times to study with him. And around 1989, I met Patavi Joyce in India. I, you know, I started Ashtanga around that time as well. And, and you know, now, now I've been to India maybe 25 times, I think, over the time. You know? I love yeah. it. It's lovely. Mm. Yeah. So that's that's a little bit of that story. That's incredible. You know, so many different aspects of yoga and breathwork and so many different incredible teachers that you've experienced on your incredible part but the thing that really uh hits me is when I experience your teachings it's so simple it is put across so simple I understand every word I'm, I'm never sort of squinting and leaning in trying to like what what, what does he mean what are, what are these things it's so simple and the that importance that you you put on, on the relaxation and the opening and the expansiveness of, of the body um i think is is probably the most important thing i learned i think in oh, so that's far fantastic in the class you know the, the two interesting things that um happen in the um in the modern world is this obsession with exercise and yeah. fitness and this more recent, in a way, obsession with meditation and relaxation. Mindfulness, and, you know, right? Mindfulness, meditation, this sort of stuff. And they're, they're both valuable things, of course. Yeah. But the real benefits that can come to health come really when you do both at the same time. Right. And 
this, I think, is the ultimate truth of what meditation and real yoga was meant to have been. Yeah. And it's also when you hear about the athlete entering the zone or the flow state. Yeah. It's that state that we really look for. And it's a state where, where um, on a physiological level, you've got enhanced blood flow while your body's nervous system is in a state of dominant parasympathetic arousal. So right. in other words, you're feeling really relaxed, but blood is flowing very easily. Nevertheless, the heart rate is very low. Your breath is also very minimal in terms of minute ventilation, mm. and you're not feeling any stress whatsoever. And that's yeah. what real yoga was meant to be. Uh, and that's what meditation was meant to be. That's what real fitness and the elite athletes world of the zone is meant to be 90% of the time. Mm. And nowadays, as an Olympic runner, you would be taught, you know, for example, when you're running for 100 minutes, it's well established that you get the best results if you're training a runner that they should run for 90 minutes where they can talk normally right. and only for 10 minutes would you run so hard that you can't talk yeah. and you know maybe for 10 minutes in that 100 minutes you might have a bit of labored talking but essentially you exercise at a pace yeah. which has all the features of what i'll call the true meditative state it must be sustainable mm -hmm. it must be engaging it must be calming it must feel effortless yet it must be invigorating and make blood flow yeah and for an elite, elite athlete they might be running at quite a pace and if we as non-athletes perhaps you know i mean i'm not an elite athlete mm -hmm. and i'm not really a runner but i know sometimes i have run with my running friends yeah. and they're like going blah 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 mm -hmm. happily chatting away and you're going shut up can't you see i'm trying to run <laughs> You know, yet for them, it's effortless. And yeah. so what we all have to find is a means of practicing in a way an exercise form, uh, a, a posture, movement, and breathing modality where it will feel effortless to us, yet it moves blood. Yeah. And so part of my quest in, and, and in the last especially 25 years when I realized the importance of getting this meditative effect while exercising was to find methods of moving blood without making the heart race and so you know part of the whole journey for that came after being with BKS Iyengar and teaching for about 10 years and yeah. this was in about 1990 I realized that I didn't really know enough that you know I've been teaching right. for 10 years and people seem to get better with their practice and people were saying wow this is great and at the time yeah. yoga was very new in, yeah. in Australia, there were not many yoga teachers. And, right. um, and wow, so that's they, that's crazy to hear now. <laughs> it's, oh, it's insane. It's now. completely insane. Right. You know? And in fact, when I first started teaching, I remember we were chanting Aum at the end of a class. Mm -hmm. And I came outside and there were people with placards saying, repent ye now, the oh, way no. of the Lord is near. This is devil worship. Oh, this no. is evil. Looked upon as a really odd fringe thing to be doing. Wow. But so I realized after 10 years of teaching in this very fringe zone mm -hmm. that I didn't really understand what I was doing. I didn't understand enough about the body. So mm -hmm. I thought I'll go back to university and I embarked upon my third university degree, which at the time was a Bachelor of uh, Applied Science in Physiotherapy. Yeah. So then, you know, my father, bless him, said, Son, what are you doing? You're getting another degree. If you, if you get another degree, you're going to turn into a thermometer. He said, <laughs> so obsessed with his sick humor. Love it. Um, but uh, I did this physiotherapy degree, and um, it really opened my eyes to physiology, which I understood a fair bit about physiology and you know, my, uh, biology already. But it made me realize that there were many things about the body I didn't know. And one of them was that blood actually flows through the body very poorly with the heart. And you can actually, when you look into it, mm. there's at least 11 other ways which allow blood to move very effectively without making the heart race. And of course, these are the ways that elite athletes and true yogis would mm. use. The most important way of moving through the blood through the body, which takes a very advanced person to do, is with the power of the mind. And essentially, wherever you think, blood's going to go. If you think of your left hand, more blood will go to your left hand. Wow. And, you know, 
I've got brilliant teachers, one of whom is a Chinese man who will stand in front of me with his hands completely relaxed. And I can feel one hand just get much, much hotter than the other when he thinks of it. In fact, he can make one hand become thick as a club and hard as a club by just pumping blood into one hand just by thinking. Wow. You know, and it's with that, insane. then he can break rocks and, and bricks with his arm. And it's, it's the power incredible. of the mind, right? Yeah. And what? it really strikes me with athletes um, with that effortless power that you're talking. When you really watch an athlete in full flow, an elite athlete, it, it, they're not pushing or trying, right? It's, especially no, exactly. those free divers, William Trubridge, especially those elite marathon runners they're they're just in their element and they're flowing through whereas do you think in the western world today we're all a little bit results driven a little bit i'm doing what i think i should do who i think i should be push 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 more 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 it's totally that it's totally right. that and you know it's it's unfortunate that the um the zest and the drive to always do our best and in, in yoga, we called it uh, something called tapas, which is doing your passionate best. Right. But people misinterpret it. They called it some sort of suffering and ardour. Actually, right. it's passion. It's about doing your best attempt, which is something which is you're so passionate about yeah. that it's like love. And sometimes something you love, you'll do a little bit harder than you normally would. Yeah. But it's because you love it so much. Right. You know, so William Trubridge is a dear friend of mine who I ardently admire and I'm totally in awe of his abilities. Yeah. And in his Incredible. passion, he, he can swim 104 meters straight down, you know, without weights, without fins. It's incredible. And he's a, a super yogi in my books. You know, he's yeah. an amazing man, a real athlete. And, uh, but, and so many people might look to him and go, he's being competitive. Mm -hmm. and maybe you could look at it that way but he will always do it in the spirit of yoga where you're being very very calm at the same time so it's okay to be competitive but you then must embark on the philosophy of life that goes with it which is also the philosophy of yoga but this is not just uh you know yoga my father taught me these things but right. it's always stay relaxed do it gently do it in a loving way my father's the last three words were love 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 my mother was the embodiment of love that's all they ever did my parents was just give love and so when you're practicing when you're doing yoga exercise posture movement breathing mental control in any way and it must go from your mat or your personal practice into your life without love it is useless absolutely so love is something that dominates when there is a state of parasympathetic arousal in your right. body and in that parasympathetic state heart rate is low breath rate is low or no breath at all right. and you've got um, no sense of um, stress inside the body and with that then your internal organs work very well you've got good immune system digestive system reproductive system yeah. because the body's internal autonomic unconscious mode emotionally is peace love safety and trust but as soon as you get into this competitive mode where you think someone could win over you, where you're in that state of sympathetic arousal, a.k.a. Stress. the state of flight, fight, fear and uh, freeze, yeah, then yeah, yeah. your unconscious mind, the subconscious system switches to sympathetic arousal where you turn off your immune system, digestive, reproductive system and forget long term health then. Right. And then also the subconscious emotions become fear, anger, aggression, lack of safety, lack of trust. So competition is fine, provided it's with that passion that I'm going to do my best, subject to being relaxed, subject to staying loving. And at mm -hmm. the end of the, at, of the time, once you've done your best, regardless of the outcome, outcome, you must be content with the outcome. I'm happy with what I've done, no matter what. Even if you lose, you're still happy that you did your passionate best. Right. And when all those things are put together, do your best subject to being loving, non-aggressive and, um, you know, gentle in your approach, loving in your approach, having done your best to be happy with the outcome. All of that makes sense. But just competition with a fighting approach, stimulating a sympathetic discharge in the body. That's just an invitation to an early grave. And it really yeah. causes in the world as well because yeah. it makes people against each other you know yeah well surely in that sympathetic state which 
so much of the world seems to be locked in this adrenalized state um it really is the state of survival right like you said yes. you're not thinking of long-term health you are thinking sort of possibly consciously or subconsciously of just surviving anything you yes. can do to survive yeah. which yeah. actually when when you zoom out of the modern world is have we come to a point where we are every man for himself um in a way and yeah. at that yeah. point i you know i think of of your teachings and the way you know with these degrees in science and the research in science and the lecturing you do how you can bring these ancient ancient practices into the modern world and how much do you think could these practices serve such a uh in a world locked in this sympathetic state it, it these are the most essential practices right. for the world we're in now yeah it's like i agree I, I unfortunately the um the modern world shuns the words yoga and meditation yeah. So I've learned that although I still practice yoga and teach yoga to those who are prepared to listen, I and I have a, a website called Yoga Synergy, which I run mm -hmm. with my with my long term friend, business partner, Bianca Matchless, who's also a physiotherapist, also yes. studied years with Iyengar, and she's an amazing woman. Um, and I'm happy to keep doing that. But I realized that 95% of the world does not accept yoga. And so what I did was I started another website just under my name for lack of thinking of anything else, right. simonborglivia.com. I think I also call it fivedimensionalflow.com as well. Right, and right. Because I wanted a name which didn't have the word yoga in it. Because yeah. if, you, if you mention the word yoga, if you, if you say to someone, would you like to come to my yoga class? One in every two will say no, just because of the word yoga. And you can do the same yeah. with meditation. Would you like meditation? No, because they assume that it's something which it doesn't necessarily mean it is. You see, most modern yoga is not real yoga in my books. Most yeah. modern meditation is not real meditation in my books because yoga and meditation should be the same thing. And when you see, say, for example, a, a real meditative monk, a Tibetan monk, for example, mm -hmm. they will sit naked in the snow. Yeah. And when you look at them, you know, you see them, you go, they're meditating and you go, hold on. It's not like we meditate because most people in the West, if they're sitting in a cold room, will cover themselves in blankets. Yeah. As you go, why is that person naked in the snow? It's because they look totally relaxed, yet blood is flowing incredibly well. Yeah. And so it's the ability to be in a semi-stressful environment, which is a semi-stressful controlled environment, mm -hmm. yet you're able to control the levels of anxiety and stress and yeah. you're able to regulate blood flow right and the problem with modern exercise is that um, modern exercise is a lot of stress and then no relaxation mm -hmm. the problem with modern meditation is it's a lot of relaxation with no invigoration no blood flow Whereas what we want is the blood flow and the relaxation at the same time mm -hmm. and when when we see modern yoga what they've done is they've actually just mostly done the two things separately. They, they do a little bit of stressful exercise that they call their yoga postures. And then they do their relaxation meditation at the end. Because mm -hmm. what you really want is the relaxation to be part of the actual practice. But that practice can't be just a passive lie on a bolster, you know, yin yeah. yoga. Like it's, that's, it has to be ha ta yoga and ha means sympathetic nervous system. Mm -hmm. Ta means parasympathetic nervous system. Yeah. And so in other words, to do a stressful exercise in yoga and not be relaxed is not yoga. To do a relaxation exercise without invigoration or blood flow is not yoga. Right. You want the ha and the ta at the same time. And this sympathetic parasympathetic balance is what gives you the regular heart rate variability, which is so important for, for autonomic control. You need both at the same time. And that's why most modern yoga misses out. That's why most modern meditation misses out. And it's only the few elite athletes and super yogis that get the benefits of it. And that's right. why in the last 15, 20 years, I, I, you know, Bianca, myself and a few others have started to develop things like this thing that you called joint synergy and mm -hmm. spinal synergy and now i call it five dimensional flow yeah. where i'm getting people to do very very simple movements and with these very simple movements they actually do move blood and yet it's something which you can become engaged in and i think the 
the class that you did with me or anyone can, if anyone wants to contact me, I can send mm -hmm. them a sample of a class like this, but it's something simple, like say, for example, rolling the shoulders. Yes, and I it's remember. It's difficult, but when you relax, you know, it, it, when you roll the shoulders and you really relax, you start noticing that your trunk starts to move. Yeah. And if you really relax, it's not just your trunk that moves, it's your hips and arms that can move. And yeah. if you really take that into its full power, someone who's very flexible could be rolling their shoulders while lifting their arms and doing full squats up and down yeah. so it's what level of exercise do you want the most difficult exercises could become the most easy if you just lessen the range of movement the speed and the muscle tension mm -hmm. so i've started to really find ways of giving um simple posture movement breathing mental control to any level of practitioner and i'm trying to do it in a systemized way where yeah. i can give a class to a thousand people and give something which is going to give the most effective response for the most people on a physical level, a physiological and mental level. Yeah. You know, it's very easy to teach one person because then you can regulate it always. But to teach a thousand people is challenging. Yeah. And the thing is, you cannot give modern yoga to a thousand people. No. You can't make a thousand people do a running exercise. So I've taken right. a lot of time to try and find out what is it that gives people the best effect most of the time with the minimal risk of problems on a physical level, which is muscles, bones, and joints, which is yeah. important for functional health. Then yeah. also on a physiological level, which is things like energy levels, the health of the immune system, nervous system, digestive reproductive system for the regeneration of cells. That's yeah. important. And everyone forgets that. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is the mental level. Are they happy while they're doing the practice or are they just doing it looking for at the end when they finish? You must yes. enjoy the practice while you're doing it and allow your brain to be finished where it's feeling clear, focused, calm, grounded while you're doing it and after you're doing it and these things often are not done with most modern exercise yeah. many people practicing modern exercise modern yoga do it because they think they have to because they know that afterwards they're going to feel good i often say to people is your exercise like this exercise where you bang your head against the wall it's uncomfortable but when you stop it feels great you know yeah. that's not that's not yoga that's not meditation no. that's just suffering and then stress stopping and going feels better now and i've stopped right 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 yeah you know what what really sticks out to me there is that everything you've been describing is about the journey is about the journey yes. of the practice the experience of the practice whereas yes. modern yoga even as it is advertised i don't even think it is the consumer's fault um as such necessarily because the way it is advertised anything fitness wise is advertised in the western world is if you will do this you will get this there yes, exactly. there there's not much of a mention about the way you might go about it or the way you move you, you could find a million squats on youtube but the way you do that squat i think actually you'd really have to have quite a dig for, and I'm not just talking about, you know, weight on the heels, shoulders down, belly button to spine. The, the synergy that you're speaking of about a deep physiological understanding of a body, but and of mind, of spirit, of everything coming together uh, to create this experience rather than, um, I learned an amazing word actually yesterday, which was destination addict. Um, I, I saw a, a phrase saying, try not to become a destination addict where you, you continuously think if I do this, I will become this, I will be this, or if I go here, I'll be this. You know, a lot of people, even if I go to Bali, then I will be a yogi if I, if I do this, etc. Whereas you could be in your grandma's basement, right? But if, if you are experiencing that shoulder roll for exactly what it is and feeling the invigoration of every inch of it, then surely that is the real point of moving, right? Yes, yeah. It's, it's partly a problem of the modern world, as you say, with this, the way things are advertised. And unfortunately, with the way the mainstream media portrays things with uh, me media personalities. Right. What happened in around 1995, 1996, people like Sting, Madonna, they all started doing yoga and it became very popular. Right. And then right after that, people started realizing we should be yoga teachers. And so 
I remember one of my friends in Australia made a nine month teacher training course and everyone wow. went, that's outrageous. Nine months. How can you possibly learn yoga in nine months? You know, we were used to training for 10, 15 years. And, yeah, and yeah, even yeah, yeah. Without teaching, we didn't think of ourselves as teachers because you had to be a master before you taught. Right. And it took decades. Yeah. And then, but by the, by the time it came to the early 2000s, the, the teacher trainings dropped to two months and then one month. And now with the pandemic, you can do a 200 hour teacher training for 200 pounds or to, you know, $200 even. Right, and you can right, do it right. online without pre recorded, you know. And this is, it's completely a travesty because yeah. these well intentioned students come thinking they're learning yoga, but they're learning from people who haven't even understood it themselves because they also went through this 200 hour situation. And yeah. there's really no possibility of understanding the depth of yoga in 200 hours, you know? It's funny because in those 200 hour courses that many people teach, they get maybe 20 hours of anatomy physiology. And I'm going, well, in my, in my physiotherapy degree and not alone, we did 3000 hours of anatomy. Right. Right. physiology you know and i still feel like i have to look up textbooks when people ask me a question of course right so, it's, the degree is the beginning you know, of the journey right of course and so yeah. it's this real quick fix thing that you know mm, yeah. i'm a teacher now i have to do this and provide stuff this is a real shame that the world has come this way yeah. and it, it really means that there's problems then in the way people present it and that they're often missing out and the same is true with fitness training the same is true with so many of the modalities that are all designed as you said for this end result and this addiction to something at the end may i also add that that this addictive quality yeah. comes as part of the uh, the way people are practicing because you know how we were saying that that many people practice in this mm -hmm exhilarating way where it's yeah they're doing it and they're getting into a state of sympathetic arousal an adrenaline and adrenalized adrenaline state rush. Right, right, right. yes and what's happening is when you get into this really a state which becomes competitive fearful state that you might lose you know it may, maybe these two people doing say mixed martial arts as an extreme right, right, right. there is this fear that you could lose in a way that could be very painful you know or you're doing something like an extreme sport like um even something not too extreme like skateboarding where yeah. if you're not careful if you fall you could break an arm break a right, leg right, right. you know even uh many other sports there's always a risk and so there's a certain amount of adrenaline that comes through you and a fearful thing of like, I'm going to do this, but am I living in the present moment or am I living 10 minutes in the future? Because when fear dominates, often the fear is driven from a future anticipation of something going wrong. Yeah. And so that's not really being meditative. That's just living in a fearful state. And But with that fearful state comes this adrenaline. And at the same time as adrenaline is pumped into the body, there's cortisol. Yeah. And then what many people do in this fearful state, and it's made worse in many modern breath control classes where yeah. people are erroneously taught to breathe more. Breathing is good for you. Yes. It's actually the more you breathe, the worse it gets. It's much better to breathe less. That's why William Trubridge can swim 250 meters on one breath. Yeah. Whereas most modern people are taught to do breathe in, breathe in right arm, left arm, is bubble arm you know inhale and then exhale and people hyperventilate when swimming or doing most exercise yeah. hyperventilation over breathing which often comes with modern exercise causes reduction of blood flow to the brain yeah. which creates almost like a marijuana effect yeah. And then when you, you know, when people get like spaced out and they go, wow, it's amazing. I've been breathing. And then uh, you just spaced out. Like Sleepy, marijuana. lethargic, Sleepy unfocused. Lethargic yeah. Energy. Exactly. And very hungry afterwards. Uh -huh. And then with the secretion in this, in the state that they go in with the overstretching, over tensing, over breathing and, uh, you know, competitive effect that people are doing for most people's exercise, you'll get the secretion of adrenaline, cortisol, which are a bit like coffee and cocaine inside the yeah. body, which are like, <laughs> and people go this is amazing <laughs> and then at the same time because it's a flight or fight response that's been evoked inside the body and you know say for example if you are a martial artist when someone punches you you don't really feel it because the body secretes endorphins right. and the endorphins are like the body's endogenous morphine it's like heroin yeah. and so you don't feel it till the next day 
Right. And many people experience exercise pain the next day. Why? Yes. Because their body was pumped full of heroin. And yes. so at the end of many modern people's exercise, be it fitness classes, you know, CrossFit, yeah. be it yoga classes, insanity. Be it aerobics, uh-huh. Insanity. They finish the practice going, wow, I feel amazing. I'm on a <laughs> runner's high, yogic high, pranic high. Yeah, no. Yeah. You're just stoned on the body's own marijuana, cocaine, caffeine, heroin at the same time. You yeah. think you're in the zone. You think you're meditating. You think you're doing yoga, but you're just off your head. Yeah. And unfortunately, that off your head, although it feels nice, is actually causing tremendous damage to the internal organs by switching off your immune system, digestive system, reproductive system. And it's a, a, a shame. It's so sad because, yeah. you know, it, this last few years, I've lost many people to cancer cancer, sickness, heart mm. problems, cardiovascular problems, yeah. many of them to cancer. And cancer is a, is a problem with the immune system, really. Yeah. You know, it's yeah, something absolutely. which is not ideal to happen. You know, we don't yeah. need stress in our lives. No, 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 Life's no. stressful enough already. Yeah. And it's incredible, actually. Um, in, I'm, I'm only 25. So in my experiences of yoga classes with now having just awakened in the last year, really, to the importance of the breath through the wonderful work of Patrick McEwen and the Oxygen Advantage, which is all about effortless light breathing, um, inspired by the work of Dr. Bateko. Um, you know, it, it fascinates me actually then looking back and realizing how little focus at all is on the breath in modern yoga classes. Um, And a lot of uh, vocabulary is used, which is nothing against the yoga teachers because it is what they've been taught, like you said, by people with the best intentions. So it's absolutely, you know, not at the fault of the yoga teachers, but you do hear, take that big breath in, fill the body with oxygen. Whereas actually, It, it only nowadays takes a quick Google to understand that, as you said, by over breathing, you're exhaling too much yes. carbon dioxide, you're actually yes. depleting the body of oxygen yes. and becoming stoned and sleepy yes. and yes. La- lacking yes. energy and concentration. The opposite and, and of you'll what we be, want. Exactly. And you'll be led to become more hungry and more yeah. craving of garbage foods. Right. You know, you'll become much more craving acidic and processed and unnurturing and unhelpful foods in your life and overeating in general, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. for me, with the breath that I've done for all the years I've done and and practice still, is I have one meal a day. It's usually in the evening, quite late. Wow. And, um, and it's usually just fruit, salad and vegetables. And in fact, I mean, for the last six months exclusively, it's just been all live, live raw food. And right. I've had periods of live food, you know, for many years at a time. Yeah. But, um, you know, very rarely will I touch anything like bread or rice. It's just fruits, salad and vegetables, you know. And it's all I feel like. It's not like I'm forcing myself. But yeah. the less you breathe and the calmer you stay, the body as an adult doesn't need that much food. I mean, when you're young, you tell people, I tell my son, eat so you get big and strong. But once you're growing up, how much bigger do you want to get? Right, right. And people eat so much as an adult, but it's because of stress, yeah. because they're turning off their digestive system. They're overstimulating their um, their physiology with um, hyperventilation. Generally, most people hyperventilate, and yeah. that causes a, a, an increase in their pH. And the body doesn't like a high pH, but the body doesn't like alkalinity, which is what happens when you hyperventilate and blow off your carbon dioxide. You have less carbon dioxide, less carbonic acid. Less acid means more alkaline. And when the body's alkaline, blood vessels to the brain shut down, the nervous system hyperstimulates, you get less transfer of oxygen from your blood cells to your body cells, as you were saying, which means you can't then uh, oxidize or, or metabolize your glucose aerobically, which means you make 20 times less energy. And therefore, people then crave food and also really crave especially high protein foods, which have a very acidic residue to neutralize that alkalinity, just so they can get some clarity back to their mind and feel a little bit less stressed. Whereas really, instead of eating amino acids, we should be retaining carbonic acid by not breathing so much. And it's a lot better. And, you know, the the most, the most, uh, uh, the most proven diet 
that gives you longevity is the eat less and you live longer diet. That's been well established for many decades. Yeah. But now they're realizing actually that it's not just eat less calories that allows you to live longer. Actually, the most important thing is not is that you eat less calories of protein and acidic foods especially mm -hmm. and you know some uh, some amino acids are, are even uh, better to avoid than others like methionine and stuff like this mm -hmm. but what we want to do as much as possible is have a diet which is as alkaline as possible subject to at the same time breathing as little as possible yes. and many people in the new age world have tried living off just fruit but of course they completely space out because if you just live off an alkalizing diet, like just a fruit diet, you get all spaced out because that also will become too alkaline. So right. when you're eating alkaline food, you must also adopt an, an acidic type of breathing regime, which is a breathing regime where you exercise, but you don't breathe much. Right. And that gives you the best result. And if I had to suggest to people what's the best form of breath control you can do, I can teach all sorts of complex breath control. Yeah. The best one is re-establish the natural breathing that you do in the deepest sleep that you did regularly throughout the day when you're a child, which is just inhale low, exhale passive, don't breathe so much, breathe through your nose and don't think about it so much. Yeah. Then, and you do that while you're exercising. Then you're exercising, but hardly breathing at all. That's what elite athletes do. Yeah. And then yeah. you get the best results. So you do yeah. need to move. You do need to move 100%. our bodies. What, what's the, the physiotherapy um, axiom? One of them is movement. So exercise is optional. Movement is essential. Right. Yeah. But, you know, they're, they're two interesting words, aren't they? Exercise and movement. Uh, because it's a wonder that this exercise these days definitely seems like my power hour at the gym, where actually, power hour at the gym, yes. yeah, you know, actually, what about just becoming someone that moves, that, that someone yeah. who moves, a person that is a mover, um, then you wouldn't need your power hour, right? Because if you were just moving all the time, exactly. a wonderful Pilates teacher said that to me, and I'll never forget it. She said, you know, all these young people working for aesthetics, whereas, you know, why not just become a person that moves? And that it, yeah. it, the simple things really hit me. And even hearing everything you're saying is the message that comes through is maybe we all need to stop trying so hard. You know, it's a lot simpler than we think. Eat less, breathe less. Yes, it's all yes. good. It's good, isn't it? You know, there was a, a film which many of the older viewers will remember perhaps it was called back to the future do you, did you remember, oh, you remember i know back one? to the future yeah i've seen it okay back to the future right so in that in that film it was a time travel story and he traveled back to 1885 yeah. and they saw this guy you know wearing these running shoes and they say what are the funny shoes for and he says they're my running shoes and they say what are they for he says running and they go why would you do that <laughs> as if you run when you have to why would you run for the fun of it right and right, it didn't right. make sense to them and yeah. to exercise for the sake of exercising yeah it's a very it happened it, it, it became a new thing i forget the name of the guy who invented aer aerobics but it happened in the 1960s late 60s where it became this fad to try and get the heart rate up you know get the heart rate up breathe more get the heart rate up no this is cardiovascular work is misunderstood and unfortunately i live in australia i love australia yeah and australians actually have reputed reputedly the best physiotherapists in the world or very high caliber physiotherapists yeah, yeah. You know, there are other countries also that have some as well but it also has a very high sporting mentality like you know for a country of 25 million we actually rank in the olympics yeah you know with places like china but there's hardly any population but everyone in australia is obsessed with exercise yeah. so with the science and the mentality um the the ideas of um, of exercise spread from Australia around the rest of the world. In Australia, we will always shorten our words. Like you know, we don't talk about what we'll do this afternoon. We talk about this arvo. Yeah. We don't eat biscuits. We eat bickies and stuff like this. So every word <laughs> is shortened. So we don't do cardiovascular work. We do cardio. Yeah. 
And cardio became an abbreviation that went all around the world. Yeah. But cardio implies the heart. Vascular implies the blood vessels. And there is no cardio system in the body. There is a cardiovascular system. So a healthy cardiovascular system is the opposite of what most people think. Heart rate must stay low. The blood vessels have to do all the work. Yeah. And that's what many people forget because they hear the word cardio, heart, cardiovascular work got to get your heart rate up no cardiovascular work means balance heart rate stays low with a little bit of variability and the blood vessels just move pretty much by themselves through the other 11 pumps of blood through the body such yeah. as the musculoskeletal pump the gravitational pump the respiratory pump the you know the um other things that i've mentioned in my talks yeah, and i'm yeah. happy to share with people in, you know in yeah. the future yeah do you think that's where the word inflow comes from it's actually talking about the flow of the blood, do you think? In the flow? Uh, it's, it's actually, a, it can definitely be applied for that, of course. Yeah. Because when we talk about flow, the most important thing with flow is that energy is flowing inside your body. And what I talk about is uh, in my hippy dippy mode, I'll mm -hmm. say what we need to do inside our body is enhance the flow and movement and circulation of good energy and loving information. Mm -hmm. And I'll say that and it sounds nice to people who are not too, you know, people, the new agey people will buy that. But some people go, that's just nonsense. You need good energy and loving it. No, good energy is good enhanced blood flow where the cardiovascular system is balanced with a low heart rate and enhanced circulation. And loving information is the information that dominates with a good balance of the parasympathetic nervous system taking a dominance. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the loving information. So good energy, loving information, healthy cardiovascular flow, low heart rate, enhanced circulation, and a dominance of the parasympathetic nervous system over the sympathetics such that there is ideal balance for immune health, reproductive health, digestive health, etc. Why don't more people know about this stuff? Is, is what in retrospect, I don't understand why, but there are more people talking about it. Yes. It's just that it's just that, you know, we're so caught up in the three second information mode, you know, like Instagram. If you, if you say something that lasts more than three seconds, people don't listen. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes people criticize me on Instagram. They say, I love watching your page, but it's so much to read, you know. And I go, well, if you want to understand something, I cannot say something in a short sentence without people freaking out. If I say to people, breathe less, everyone goes, that's not right. And I go, no, breathe less, but exercise more. No, that's a bit more to read. You, know, the, yeah. you have to explain why. They have to read more. Yeah. So people's attention span is too short. They want a quick fix, and they know they won't get the reality of it, especially when the mainstream media is pumping out things like look good is more important than feel good. You know, yeah. it's all about how you look. You know, put more makeup on. Forget the fact that you're pumping shit inside your body and it's coming out through your skin. That's why you need the makeup. Yeah. You know, and the, we're, the mainstream media is so insidious. People actually believe it. You know, they're, 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 the mainstream media is not just what the advertising is. It's the movies that we see. Yeah. It's, it's the, the news that we see as well. You know, I mean, that we are terrified about something that is invisible around us right now, that are people are uh, not able to shake each other's hands anymore, that people cannot hug each other because they're terrified of a disease which seems to kill less people than the flu ever did before. Yeah. This is a travesty of, of, the, of the human situation today, you know, and, and I don't want to make it a political uh, talk, but, but, but as a molecular biologist, I will really and honestly, you know, stand my ground when I say that what people are doing with the situation with the, uh, I won't say the word, Word, but yes. what's terrifying the world at the moment mm -hmm. is uh, is just not science at all to me. Yeah. And as, if they're trying to make a protective device that you have to have to you know, put inside your body with an injection before you get on a plane or something like that, how can they make any sort of injection for you when they haven't even isolated the thing they're injected you against? You know, yeah. the, the the whole notion behind the science that they're trying to pump into us, which they just sort of say is science. And people believe it because the word science is enough to make people believe these days. Right, right. Yet as a scientist, a published research-based scientist, yeah. science is also very, very tainted. And there's a very wonderful man in the UK 
called Rupert Sheldrake, mm -hmm. who wrote some amazing books. And of course, when he wrote them, he's also a very, very uh, you know, revered scholar. Yeah. But when he started saying the things which went against mainstream science, like his most recent book is The Science uh, Delusion, where he talks about the 10 dogmas of science right. and the things that people assume are true and science is based on. But really, when, when you look at them, they're just assumptions. Right. And unfortunately, the media has taken the science that it's complete nonsense that they're presenting it to the people, but because it's on the media and has the word science in it, people believe it. Yeah. And it's such a shame because if all you have to do is look a little bit into it and find the holes in what they're saying. Yeah. And it becomes that people are following science like a religion. And actually the most atheistic, agnostic people in the world are as adamant yeah. about their their devotion and their reverence and their faith in science. Mm -hmm. But if you have to believe science, then all you're doing is having the same faith that someone who believes in heaven is having. Because yeah. unless you, you have to understand science. Right. If you just believe what someone tells you, that's not science. That's just faith. Yeah. And that's what people are, are dogmatic about. Right. And it's such watered down nonsense that people are putting through the mainstream media and presenting to us. Yeah, I mean, it, it all it all seems like such a lack of curiosity and a lack of questioning. There's yes. there, yeah. less and less now are you hearing, but why? Or but why? how did that yeah. happen? Or or uh, let's let's look deeper into this, like not, you know, let's let's take take the first word you read for it let's actually have a look into what we're really looking at here and and i uh, i hugely agree and um perhaps that's what we need right going right back to where we mentioned that stereotype that's attached to yoga and the word meditation that you know with a more open mind comes a more open heart and then i think the world may be a, a better place in, in that way once people enter a state of fear and the world in lockdown right now is in fear. Yes. And most people are buying it. At the, in that fearful place, they shut down the loving thinking part of their brain and they go into their primal brain. Mm -hmm. Love shuts down uh, and fear opens up. You just get not so much thinking to the rational part of the brain. Yeah. And it's such a sad, it's such a shame. You know, I feel sorry for the children being brought up in this world who think this is normal. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm so hoping that things will change, but, um, you know, maybe this year brings better things. I hope so. I've got lots so. of very, very depressed friends, you know, some of whom are living in London and, you know, yes. they're locked in isolation by themselves. They can't we see are. best friends. It's horrible. Nope. You know? nope, and, we are. you know, I, I said to you before that my mum died uh, a few days yes. ago. And I was trying to take her for therapy. And the therapy is one hour's drive north of where we are. Right. And it should only take an hour, 55 minutes, in fact. Right. But because of the lockdown and I had to cross a border, it took five hours for the journey. Oh, my goodness. And my poor mother, you know, could have done well with the treatment. But she missed three quarters of the treatment because she was late. And also she suffered by sitting in a, you know, a polluted yeah. environment of the car for all that time, you know? And so many people have died through suicide and yeah. depression. And it's just a really, really sad case and situation that, that we're living in. And, and I hope people eventually wake up. I agree. And, yes. and realize. You know? yes. What we want is immune health. Start with what you do with your own body every day, with how you move, what postures you adopt, how you breathe, how you think, and what goes into your mouth and how you breathe, etc. Yeah. And how you act with the friends around you. Yeah. My feeling is share good energy and loving information inside yourself. Use that as a model to share with the people around you. And then the world is a better place. Yeah, well, what an incredible note to finish on. I, I was going to ask you, you know, uh, what, what, what would be your message going forward into 2021, but I think <laughs> it's you, you said it. And uh, yeah, uh, absolutely mind blown as inspired and more than I expected to be talking to you. So thank you so much for, for coming on and talking to me. It's, it's been amazing. And I could talk to you for hours, um, but of course I don't want to take up too much of your time. So thank you so much, uh, Simon. Bless you.
Georgie, it's such a pleasure to meet, to meet a person. You said you're 25 years old, and it's just a pleasure to meet someone of your age who has the wisdom and the courage to speak as you do and do what you're doing and share it with the world. And I really commend you and thank you thank for you. inviting me and sharing this time. And I see already that you're sharing good energy and loving information in yourself and sharing it with others. So keep spreading that message. It's a great message. And it's such a pleasure to be here with you in this time. And if anyone wants to contact me, yes. please let them know that I'm, yes. uh, I have two websites, simonborgolivia.com and yes. also yogasynergy.com. So you yeah. could write to simon at simonborgolivia.com or simon at yogasynergy.com yeah. or my full name, which I imagine you'll put in the notes. Oh, I'll put can, all the uh, website links in the show yeah, notes put, put, and uh, your um, Instagram Messenger, too. Or Facebook, I um, contact yeah. people. If people contact me or if they go to my, my website, simonborgolivia.com yeah they can subscribe to my newsletter yes. and i can send them a bunch of links which will include simple practices for all ages yeah. which they can do to get into a meditative zone like flow state while keeping the nervous system calm yet encouraging blood flow good energy and loving information exactly you know, so i'm happy to share as much as i can and thank you once again for sharing what you're sharing and it's a pleasure to spend this morning with you yes. i only had a couple of hours sleep to get up and meet you but it was well <laughs> worth it Thank you. So, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd highly recommend uh, all of Simon's practices. Please, please go check them out. But yeah, thank you so, so much.